Well, you can join with me in opening your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one under a seat in front of you, and the text we're looking at is on page 959 in those Bibles. And if you don't own a Bible, please grab one of those under a seat and just take it home with you and keep it. We would love for you to have this um, as your copy of God's Word. Well, our purpose as a church is to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus Christ who are a community of worshipers on mission. So at the heart of our purpose as we glorify God ultimately is discipleship, right? Being and making disciples of Jesus. And the three words that we use to express what that looks like is worship, community, and mission. So worship is upward toward God. Community is inward toward one another. And mission is outward to the world. So we just finished a couple month series that emphasized our outward mission. And so now we're going to take a couple weeks to focus on our connection to one another in community. So we're focusing on what it means to be church members. A couple months ago, we as leaders clarified and um, updated our church membership process. So we've always had a high view of church membership from the beginning of our church. We've always emphasized that church membership is important and that it's deeply relational. We also shared that over time we've experienced a challenge regarding clarity. So as newer people came and were engaged, it's not always been clear when they became a member, either to them or to uh, leadership. And Hebrews 13 also says that church leaders will give an account as shepherds for the sheep in their flock. So the elders will stand before the Lord Jesus one day and give an account for how we, they, have shepherded every sheep in this church. So that is really meaningful to us and has been um, for a long time as elders. And so it's important for people to know that they're members, and it's important for elders to know who they're responsible for. And so we shared that we put together a simple process. If someone wants to become a member, they'll participate in our Discover ZF course, which explains just what the gospel is that we believe and what does it look like to be a member of a local church, and this local church in particular. And then they'll meet with an elder, and the goal is simply to confirm uh, that they're Christians, which is the heart of membership. And then the elders affirm that they are members. So when we shared this, we said that we would also teach on church membership. So this series, we're focusing on what the church is and why it's important. So this won't be comprehensive. In many ways, we talk about the church all the time. Um, most sermons have an explicit focus on what does it mean not just to be an individual Christian, but to live out our Christian life with other members and then also publicly in the world in our various vocations and spheres of life. So what we're going to do is focus on two key aspects of what it means to be a member. We're focusing on two words, membership and friendship, or members and friends. So that's this Sunday and next. So this morning, we're going to see that one of the most central, we're going to see one of the most central images for the church in the New Testament. It's repeated over and over and over again throughout the letters of the New Testament, and the images of a body. So this is from 1 Corinthians 12, what we're going to look at this morning in particular, verses 12 to 26. So here's what this text shows us. Because the church is the body of Christ, membership matters, and every member matters. So let's read 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. 
If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, like organs, are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty and covering, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So the church that this was written to had a lot of issues, especially just a lot of division and dysfunction. Every church today can slide into the problems that the church at Corinth that Paul's writing to here had and the kinds of behaviors that they had. Some of you have been hurt by your past experiences with a local church, maybe many times over the course of different in your experience with different churches. But it shouldn't be that way. This text gives us a vision for how the church can have a culture of unity, love, honor. It can be a place of real belonging. And this vision for what the church can and should be is what our culture, our society needs, and every society needs. But especially in ours, we're in this hyper-individualistic culture where loneliness is viewed as an epidemic and we push ourselves further and further into isolation with the, with the way that we live our lives and the values that we have. And yet at the same time, we long for community. We long for a sense of belonging. We long for connection. We want to be part of something significant where everyone matters, where everyone's loved. And this is what the Lord Jesus came into the world to give. He came to create the church as a new humanity, which is partly why it's fitting that if we're a new humanity, we could be described as a human body. And so this is one of the images that the New Testament uses to describe the church, both the universal church of all Christians united to Jesus and also each local church as an expression of that universal church, a body. It shows why church membership matters and why every member matters. So there's three main movements to the text we just read, and this gives us three insights into what it means for church membership or what, how to understand church membership. So we'll see that the church is Christ's body, the church needs you, and you need the church. So first insight, the church is Christ's body. So this image of a body teaches us the nature of church membership. This image shows how church membership is a necessary part, not just kind of an optional part for Christians who like this kind of thing, a necessary part of the Christian life. So here's the context. Paul is addressing a particular issue at this point in the letter in this church in Corinth, and it's the issue that has to do with spiritual gifts. So the Holy Spirit has equipped every member of his body with a certain gift to serve one another with, and the problem here is that the church is valuing some people and some gifts over others, and it's creating a selfish and divided church. And so Paul's addressing this problem of selfish disunity here, and one of the ways that he does this is by introducing this image of the church as a body, as the body of Christ. So look at verse 12. For just as the body is one, speaking of just the body in general, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body— so it is with Christ. So it seems like the main idea here is pretty clear. A body is one body, but has many parts, right? Many different parts, unity and diversity. Both are important, and it's the same with the church. A lot of different people join together as one. And notice the centrality of Jesus here. Notice he doesn't say, just as the body, the human body, is one in many, so it is with the church. He could have said that. Notice what he said. He said, so it is with Christ. 
So it's not just that the church is a body, as if this is a church-centric thing. It's that Christ has a body, and the church is that body. He summarizes this at the end of verse 27, right at the end of the reading that we had. He said, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So Jesus is always central here. You don't have a church if you don't have Jesus. And this is true of all the images of the church. Again, we're just looking at one this morning, a body, but we could look at this image of the church as a temple with Jesus as the chief cornerstone, or the church as a family with God as a father and Jesus as our elder brother and so forth. Jesus is always central. So I wonder if when Paul wrote this in particular, he thought back to when he first encountered the risen Jesus. Paul was not just a non-Christian. He was an anti-Christian, right? rounding people up to throw him in prison. And then the risen Christ appeared to him when he was on a road in a vision. And Jesus said to him in Acts 9, 4, Saul, Saul, which was his Hebrew name, why are you persecuting me? Not, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting me? So, body of Christ. This is Christ's very body. You mess with Jesus' people, you're messing with him. So the church is not just a social club with common interests, though many gatherings and groups of people that call themselves Christian churches today, that really is what they are. Just a gathering like a social club. Totally horizontal, totally human. Jesus, though, is to be central. It's about him uniting people to himself through faith so closely that they're considered his very body and members of one another. And so when he joins us to himself, he's joining us to one another, which is why union with Jesus and union with his people are not to be separated in the Christian life. We're joined to both at the same time because being united to Jesus is being united to his body, his people. So what is the church? It's the body of Christ. Who is the church? Who gets to be part of then the church? Who's part of the body? Well, it's not everyone in the world. It's not everyone who attends some kind of Christian gathering or even claims to be a Christian. It's those who are united to Jesus by faith. And I love how verse 13 puts it. Verse 13 explains how we get united to Jesus' body. It says this, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So we're baptized or plunged or immersed into two realities here. The first is that we're baptized in the spirit, he says, which I take to mean baptized into the spirit. For in one spirit, we were all baptized. It's most likely refers to a spiritual reality that happens when someone becomes a Christian. They are baptized into the spirit. So the word baptized is probably being used figuratively here. We are plunged or immersed into the new realm, new world of spiritual experience, the, the realm of the Holy Spirit. And then second, we're baptized not just in the spirit, but also into the body, into one body, into the church. We are plunged into or joined into the body of Christ. So when someone trusts in Jesus, when someone becomes a Christian, they are baptized into the church, joined to Christ's body. So Paul's referring to spiritual realities here. Baptism, this spiritual plunging into Christ and his body and the spirit. But these realities are physically expressed in life. And they're expressed in physical baptism and participation in the local church. So think about the physical act of baptism. It's a, it's a symbolic physical act that pictures this spiritual reality of being baptized into the spirit, into the church, and into Christ. So it's physically expressing this. It's a, an act that symbolizes then not just being joined to Jesus, as we commonly emphasize, and rightly so, but it's also about being physically joined to a church, to his body. So it's not only about union with Jesus, but union with the church. 
So it was a very real sign that pictured someone joining with Jesus publicly and identifying with his people publicly. People are baptized into the body of Christ and it happens at a local level as part of a local church. So in our Western individualistic society, we tend to view baptism as a mere individual decision in isolation from other Christians or a local church community. But in the New Testament and throughout church history, it was a communal reality as well. To be baptized was to publicly identify with Jesus and his church. You're joined to Christ and his people. So when someone believed in Jesus, a church would affirm this and welcome them and baptize them. And they were baptized not just into a general sense of being a Christian to carry on with their individual Christian life and neither here nor there whether or not they participate and stay in the local church. It wasn't that. They're baptized not just into this general sense of being a Christian, but into the fullness of being a Christian in community. So there's no isolated Christianity in the New Testament. The only example you can find is this eunuch from Ethiopia that's traveling back home, uh, likely traveling home from then on to plant a church um, and spread the gospel and create community there. And Paul includes this little phrase here that pictures the radical nature of the new community as well. He says, Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. So this radical idea of this new kind of community not brought together because of common interest, of age, or socioeconomic status, or common heritage, or ethnicity, or culture. Instead, brought together across all those barriers to create a new humanity in Jesus. So the body of Christ is really, at the same time, both radically exclusive and radically inclusive. So it's exclusive, right? Because this is for Christians, only Christians, united to Jesus. That's how you become a part of this. But it's also radically inclusive. The Christian movement has been the most inclusive movement in human history and is today the most inclusive group, not just religion, but group in the world. People from all backgrounds coming together, not getting along perfectly, but truly joined together and working through these things. Again, sometimes in beauty and sometimes failing, but this is the vision here. So the first insight that we're seeing is that the church is the body of Christ. So here's what it means for us before we continue. First, it means that church membership is biblical. Now, that's not to say that every single way that every church practices church membership is biblical. There's a lot of different ways to express this and think about this practically in churches. But the idea, the concept of church membership is biblical and it's important. The idea didn't come from Costco or, you know, Lifetime Fitness and think, you know, man, they've really got something going on there. We can probably collect some dues. I mean, it's a totally different idea. It's from texts like this one. Membership is at the heart of several images for the church. Christians are members of Christ's body. We are members of a family. We are members of a household. So when we hear the word membership, that's what we should think of, being membered or members of a body, a family, a household. And this assumes that every Christian is a member of a church in this sense. There's no isolated Lone Ranger Christianity in the New Testament. There's no do-it-myself Christianity. There's only Christianity in community. To be a Christian in the New Testament is to be united to Jesus and his people, which takes expression through being baptized and being part of a local church. And this is really what the local church is about. It's not a building, it's a people. In, in other words, we could say it this way, a church is its members. Right? Zionsville Fellowship is the members of Zionsville Fellowship, not a building itself. Just like a family is its members of the family. A country is its citizens. A team consists in the members of that team. And so a church is its member. Second implication is that church membership is for Christians. It's only for Christians, and it's for all Christians. 
The members of a local church are those who are joined to Jesus. And so as best as we can, in our visible way of living out reality here, as best we can, we want to reflect the universal body of Christ, of those who are united to Jesus. And so a local church body is to be a visible expression of the universal church body. And so it matters that we believe the one true gospel and affirm our faith together in Christ. This doesn't mean that everything that we do is only for Christians. Anyone and everyone is welcome at our gatherings, just like a home has a family, while also swinging doors wide open for guests to come. A nation has citizens, even as it, as it welcomes visitors and refugees and travelers. Third, implication is that church membership is deeply relational. So it's not only biblical and it's for Christians, it's deeply relational. To be a member of a church body is to be an active participant in the life of that church body. Every part of a body matters. Every part's engaged. It's the same with the church. To be a member is to be actively engaged in the lives of other members. This is why we've We've said, really, there's no idea of something called inactive membership, right? That would be non-membership, right? That would be being severed from the body, no longer a part of the body. And so I also want to gently say this has implications for how Christians should view live streaming. Live streaming is a relatively new thing, and so we want to think carefully about it. We've decided as a church to have it continue post that event that happened um, in 2020, um, and we see it as a blessing for three kinds of people, maybe more, but as these came to mind, first would be members who are sick and can't be here at our physical gathering. Second would be members who are traveling and want to stay in the loop, though of course it's also encouraged to join and, and visit another actual church gathering when you're gone, but it's for members who are traveling as well so they can stay in the loop. And then third, it's for anyone who's interested in seeing what our church is about before they visit. I know many of you have come here on a Sunday after checking out the live stream for um, a couple weeks, and that's all great, and those are great blessings. But live streaming is not a replacement for being present. It can't be. It's a great blessing, but it's not so much going to church as it is watching people go to church. So I'd encourage us to hold it as a blessing in its proper place, but every Christian needs to be deeply connected relationally in the lives of other church members. This also means that being part of a parachurch ministry is not a replacement for a church. When I was going to college, I had to make sure that the campus ministry I was involved in didn't replace my engagement in a local church. I wanted to be membered at a church with a pastor, with elders, with brothers and sisters of all other ages engaged. I didn't do it perfectly, but especially later on as Christine and I got married and I was still in school, we, we just threw ourselves in the lives of our local church and it was a great blessing. This also means that we prioritize the public gathering of the local church when we're together. Uh, the church means assembly. So it's an assembly of God's people. So when you're in town, when I'm in town, we prioritize being here. We make being present with God's people a non-negotiable. So it's not a, a Saturday night or Sunday morning kind of, does this weekend work for us? What do you want to do? Does it work right? No, this is a non-negotiable. We're members of a body, and this is one time that we come together to function together. And if we have to leave a local church, we leave a local church to join another local church. And by the way, I am happy to help you find a new local church um, if you are moving or even if just in this area, for whatever reasons, you need to find a new local church. There can be unhealthy reasons to leave a local church and there can be healthy leave, le reasons to leave a local church. So if you're moving away, I know people in other cities, I can do some searching for you. I'd love to help people do that um, because it's so important when you move somewhere, not to just spend so long drifting around, but to find a good local church and a healthy local church. So we prioritize being a functioning body member. So the church is the body of Christ. Okay, really long first point, shorter second, third point. Here's the second insight. The church needs you. And this all just flows from what we've already seen. If you are a member of the body of Christ, then the body of Christ needs you to function as a member. You matter. The Lord Jesus 
if he has chosen you and saved you, he has also gifted you and with, with the intent that you would function and serve and bless other members of a local church. And so you have a, a purpose. In this next part, Paul addresses the issue of some parts of the body thinking that they're not needed. So he describes a kind of ridiculous situation of human body parts talking to one another and thinking about one another in verses 15 to 16. So he says, if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Well, that wouldn't make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. That wouldn't make it any less part of the body. So the foot and the ear are feeling like they don't matter. And so the foot, you know, sees the hand doing all sorts of cool things. You know, grabbing coffee mugs, typing like a boss, you know, wiggling. I don't know. Just there's all sorts of cool things hands can do. And the foot's thinking, man, that's really cool. I'm just kind of stuck in this shoe. I don't matter. And Paul's saying, you're still a part of the body. And the ear is looking at the eye saying, man, that's really cool. I mean, they write books of how the eye kind of gives evidence that there's a creator because who this, this can't evolve into place, right? You could probably think of how an ear might or at least the way it looks, you know, um, or they may have a way to, ways to go when you think about it, you know, the way it looks. Just kidding. I'm not insulting the way ears look. Take it back. <laughs> Um, but you can see this conversation Paul has of just parts of the body thinking, man, I'm just not as cool as other parts of the body. I'm not as useful as other parts of the body. And Paul's like, so what? You're still there and you're still important. So don't look at other parts and think that you don't matter just because you don't have that kind of role. I wonder if you ever feel like that. You see someone who's just omnicompetent, maybe even gifted as you are, but just seemingly doing it way better way more often, having way more opportunity. And you're thinking, man, even if I did have those opportunities, I couldn't do it like that person. You look around and see all sorts of other men or women who are just amazing at things. And you think, what do I have to offer? I just feel like I'm an imposter. And Paul has two responses to you. The first is, the church needs you. It's verse 17. He said, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Or an eye, where would be the sense of smell? The foot may not feel as cool as the hand, in other words, but without the foot, that hand can't get around and go places. You have something to contribute. There are people you can love and serve. Here's his second response. The body including your place in it, is God's idea. God made the church as a body, and every part is important. So you matter, because God made it this way. This is verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. So don't feel like you don't matter. Don't feel like your gift doesn't matter. And maybe you don't like the way that you're wired. You don't like the spiritual gift he's given you. There's a posture of humility that says, but the Lord made me this way, and I'll receive it. We're having an issue in this culture-wide right now, of course, right, with just receiving things even like gender as a gift and our embodied experience as a gift and the way our face looks even as it ages as just a part of life. We don't like the way things are. And Paul is saying here, with your role in a church family, God ordered it this way. Receive it as a gift. Don't devalue what God values. You matter. So this is the second insight. You're a part of the body and you matter. I want to encourage you, especially if you feel like you have nothing to contribute or you feel like you're just on the outside. If you're a Christian, the Spirit has given you a place in this church and some special ability to bless others. The church needs you. So sometimes that looks like plugging into a formal ministry. Be listening for opportunities to serve and bless other people in ministries that have developed in our church family. Most often, this will happen in low-key ways. It's sometimes about finding the loneliest person in the room rather than thinking that you're so lonely. You find the loneliest person in the room, or if you are the loneliest, the second loneliest person, and sit by them and encourage them and bless them and encourage them. Find the way that God has gifted you. 
use that. Notice a gap in something and encourage people or step in to be an encouragement to make it better. Sometimes it'll be hard. Sometimes you'll try to get connected and it doesn't work. You try to serve and maybe the person you're reaching out to isn't responsive, which is why the next chapter, chapter 13, is so important. It says love is patient and kind. We extend grace. We keep loving. We keep seeing how we can contribute. Every stage of life can feel like it creates a new obstacle for participating in the life of a local church. So if you're unmarried in a church with many people who are married, you can often feel like you don't fit, but you do. And every, there are people that need you. You matter in this church. Or if you're married in a church filled with younger people who are not married, you can feel like you don't quite fit. Your lifestyle or your rhythms of life don't fit e anymore. It's hard, but you matter. If you're young in a church that has many older people, you can feel like you don't belong or you're not important or you're overlooked or dismissed but you have gifts to contribute. If you're older, you may think like you have nothing left to offer, but so many young people and other peers need your wisdom, your experience, and your friendship. I'm so grateful for how so many of you invest in younger people and the next generations here and keep pursuing each other across generations and friendship. So the church needs you. Last insight, you need the church. We just saw that because every part of the body matters, you matter. And now we see this also mean, means that the rest of the church should matter to you. You need the church. So if verses 15 to 20, we're addressing this issue of feeling inferior, like you don't have a place, you're unneeded, verses 21 through 26 deal with feeling superior and self-sufficient as if you don't need the other members of the body. So this is verse 21. The eye, right, the special eye here, can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And then Paul says some parts of a, a human body may not seem important, but they are. Some parts are weaker, right, these organs inside of us. And what do we do with us? Right? They're protected, they're covered. Some parts don't seem very honorable, but we make sure to give them special privacy. The point is that some parts look important maybe some parts don't look important but they're all important so don't feel superior to other people to other members don't think that you don't need them otherwise this would be like a body saying because the head is really important i don't need the feet or because the arms are really important i don't need the legs in the church it'd be like someone gifted with maybe teaching saying we really don't need the relational stuff, you know? What's really important is teaching and instruction and thinking. We just need to learn. Or someone who thinks action is important, really good at doing, really good at getting things done, loves checklists and working through them, saying, what's with all the theology and sermons? Got to get stuff done, right? Just serve. That's what the church is about. Do. Here's one way to think about it. Think about People in a church is having kind of three categories as gifts. So one way to think about these is there's a cluster of gifts that we call prophetic type gifts, some more like priestly type gifts, and some kingly type gifts. So prophetic people are vision-oriented, leadership, teaching, preaching, calling people to do something. Priestly would be relational-oriented, orient counseling, encouraging, making sure there's a culture of love, Kingly people are administratively oriented, getting details done, building systems for accomplishing things. So prophets are thinkers, priests are relators, kings are doers, super oversimplified, but it's helpful for this thought experiment. So what happens if you have a church that has a problem with some people feeling superior to others, like verse 21? Well, here's how it gets worked out. The prophetic type people think that teaching, doctrine, vision are the most important in the church and they'll think sure relationships are fine action's good but teaching and doctrine are essential that's what we should focus on and then the priestly people think well do all the teaching you want have all the doctrine you want but if people don't feel cared for you're failing we got to spend time together we need relationships we need love we need to make sure people aren't getting lost in the shuffle and the kingly people think I see plenty of big picture ideas with these prophetic types. 
I see a lot of coffee meetings and counseling sessions going on with these priestlies, but when is something going to happen? Right? Ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim. Can we fire already? <laughs> right? So the question is, do you hear yourself in one of those? All good instincts, all important. God's gifted the church. The danger is in feeling superior and thinking that your view of things is the only way to view anything and you dismiss other people rather than trying to see how they all fit together and how you are important, but so are other people as well. So if we get a, this vision of the church as a diverse body, it can become a beautiful community. So Paul focuses on this positive vision in verses 25 and 26. So he shows what a church looks like if we really do value each other. If we're engaged, we're involved. He's saying it's a church of unity, of care, and honor. Three marks of a gospel culture. It's what every Christian is called to cultivate. So look at verse 25. He's saying these things, that there may be no division in the body, so unity, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So we suffer together with mutual care. I mean, have you ever stubbed your toe and right, your whole body comes around it and gets engaged, right? Or have you tweaked your back or put out your back? I mean, I've done that, and I'm just on the ground, minimum six hours. Like the whole day, I could not move. And then for a few days, my whole body is aware of this, right? Have you experienced that, right? When one part of your body suffers, your whole body is aware of it and suffers as well. So when someone is suffering in the church body, other members come around to comfort, to listen, to help, to pray to give meals. So many of you are so good at all of those. And I love this last line. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The English poet George Herbert once identified that the greatest sign, he identified the greatest sign of holiness. And he said, it's rejoicing in someone else's success. You can't do that if you're thinking about yourself and you feel superior or even if you feel inferior, because that turns into self-pity and it's still self-focused. But if you can love others, then you will rejoice in their success humbly. And Paul's saying, this is the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ because this is Jesus himself with his character by the Spirit getting replicated in a church to create a culture of suf mutual suffering and care and love. Is this not what Jesus does for us? How does he care for his body? He lays his life down for his bride so that we might be united together also as a body. And he cares for us. He's interceding for us all the time. He sent the Holy Spirit. He, in fact, said that I'm leaving so that I can send the Spirit. Why? Primary purpose, that the Spirit might be a comforter to you. So the Lord Jesus sent the Spirit so that the Spirit could comfort his people in their suffering. And he rejoices in even the good things that he, by the Spirit, inspires for us to do. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. So every church is to have a gospel culture of mutual care, help, and honor. So those are the three insights. The church is the body of Christ. This means that local church membership matters. Every Christian is called to be a part of the body like this, engaged, active, pursuing unity and care and love. The church needs you. You have something to offer, to serve, to bless, to love, to honor, and you need the church. Honoring other people, rejoicing in their success, receiving their help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the one who in infinite wisdom designed your people to be a body. We thank you so much for Zionsville Fellowship and the seemingly endless blessings that members have experienced over the decades as part of this local church. We pray that you would give us this culture of love, unity, honor, engaged and active service to one another. We thank you for having the Spirit equip members with gifts to serve one another. 
And we pray that as we do this, you would expand the body, that more and more people would be united to Jesus and his church, in part because of the witness of this church. And we thank you for other local churches in this area who are part of the universal church and are also brothers and sisters with us. We pray that you would bless them this morning and encourage them in their mutual fellowship as a body. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.